Uh, herzlich willkommen. Um, welcome to, to the office here. So this is not the only office um, we have here, but right around the corner in Theaterstraße, there is like the larger part of the company sitting there. This is the new space here. Um, in total, we are here about 80 plus people, students not included, I think. Um, the company as a whole is like an American company. It's pretty large. It's um, three and a half thousand people um, in 25 offices worldwide. Um, and we're doing products like go to meeting and go to webinar, which is like meeting software and webinar training software. A um, bunch of other different products for um, real-time communication and collaboration. Um, LastPass, which is a password manager, is also by, by Log Me In. So maybe you know a couple of the products we have. Um, it's it's a pretty large company overall. And as I read, like the top five um, among the top five global SaaS companies, whatever that means. We are also the fourth largest audio provider in the world, and we have like um, 300 million connections annually that we serve just with our meeting products. So, um, so from that, um, my talk today will be about building bridges. Um, it's about a communication for our asynchronous communication framework that we have developed internally for our own needs. Um, which unfortunately will not open source, but as a spoiler, at the end we will have something that I um, announced that we will open source, so maybe that's helpful for you also. Um, a quick intro to our code base. So looking at just the real-time communication collaboration products, that's the stuff that we built here in Dresden um, mostly. Um, it's, it's a pretty mixed code base. So most of the stuff is like C++ for all the heavy lifting, transport, encryption, um, of course, all the native clients. Most of the backends are C++ in most parts. Um, but we also do have quite a lot of ty TypeScript and JavaScript stuff. So it's, of course, for the web apps, for testing, but also a lot of business logic is written in JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, with one example that I want just to pick out because fits the title of the talk. Um, we have something called the audio bridge, which is like a key piece of our audio infrastructure for, for the meetings um, that we host. And um, that one really has like a pretty wide mix of C++, mostly plus TypeScript for, um, for all the business logic stuff. So that's the case where actually the framework that I'm going to introduce um, comes into play. So what's actually the need? Why do you need to mix languages and runtimes um, at all? So why would you do it? It just feels like pain you shouldn't need to take, right? Um, so first, of course, there are always hard requirements for implementing specific components. Some components you need like the native raw speed of, of C++. Um, in other cases, if you're like in a browser, you just cannot use C++. You could use like um, WebAssembly or compatible stuff, but plain C++ just out of the box is not the language of choice, and it's also not the runtime of choice. So that's the case. If you have to interface between those, there you have, or you have to use both, then then you have to interface, of course, as well. So one example, for example, the the audio bridge that we have, that's just an illustration, um, has it like an embedded JavaScript runtime in it, which keeps all the authentication logic and like business logic and join flow logic for for audio for the meetings, um, but all the um, heavy lifting pieces like transport and media processing and all that, that's all living in the C++ world. But it's one process in that case, um, and somehow you need to connect both pieces. Or if you take like an Electron app, which maybe some of you have, have developed as well, um, then usually you want to put most of the, the scripty stuff and all the UI stuff in, in JavaScript, uh, but you still may rely on like encryption that's living in, in, in a native module, basically. Um, and if you have to mix those stuff, you can either decide like, um, okay, I'll port the component if it's possible from C++ to JavaScript, but that's just expensive. And if you have to support like multiple platforms like we do, we have like Windows, Mac, iOS, um, Android, Linux for the backends that, that gets just terribly expensive. So, um, and in the end, if you like change one authentication algorithm, for example, and you mess it up at one place because you have to do it at several places, then things will just terribly break, break up. So that's really a reason why you want to reuse components written in a specific language and interface between them. So one question that came up while we were thinking about how to do it was a lot of times like, why another framework? So we came from a situation where we had a lot of 
handwritten glue code um, for object serial serialization and also for different language bindings or bindings to V8 from C++, for example, which is kind of hard to maintain. Um, but also we wanted to, to use the, basically the approach to mix and match JavaScript and C++ code in inter-process communication, in in-process communication, and maybe also in clusters where we have like multiple machines that need to communicate with each other. Um, of course, we could have used like low-level IPC stuff like Boost IPC or gRPC or just plain REST APIs to, to interconnect the pieces, but those are very low level and they are not working on an object-oriented level, which is kind of, it would work, but since we're dealing most of the time with like object-oriented abstractions, that just does not work nicely. So it's, you have to write lots of boilerplate, which is kind of a pain. And a last option would be to use like real cross-platform middleware, fat middleware like Horba. Um, I personally never had to work with that. I'm really happy about that. From what I heard, it's, it's really like a pain. Um, so that, that also wasn't really an option for us. So we ended up basically at saying, okay, we want to develop our custom-made framework for interfacing between JavaScript and C++. And this was also the goal, to have an easy way to interface between the languages and their runtimes. Um, Primary goal was to do it if, if you have like um, one embedded in the other in the same run runtime, uh, in the same process. So for example, a node process that has like native components in it or um, a C++ application that has an embedded V8. Um, but we wanted to still have the option to, to do that also across different processes, multiple processes on the same machine or also in a cluster where we have multiple machines talking to each other. And we, of course, wanted, didn't want to have like remote procedure, remote procedure calls. We wanted to have true object remoting. So you wanted to use an object and it should feel just like the actual implementation, even though it's remote. And also, since we're dealing a lot with like distributed stuff, um, just enforcing asynchronous best programming practices was just um, fundamental, I think, for the whole framework. And of course, the developer should have an easy way to, to integrate all that and not have to write lots of boilerplate stuff for that. So one thing I need to mention is I'm not the original author of that thing. So a lot of work has been done by Jupp Müller and Michael Schnipper, but also by Hendrik up there. So he did a lot of the um, code generation pieces. Um, and I joined later on and did some contributions in there. So from a bird's eye view, if you have two runtimes, and let's just assume you have like one, one runtime in the outside, basically another one embedded in the inside, and you have a component that you want to use in the outside runtime, but it's living in the inside runtime, um, then what you need is basically on the outside some form of stub, right? So something that represents the object in the outer runtime, um, just like it is living in the inner runtime. And you want to use it from the application code. So to get into from one run runtime into the other, we have a transport channel. That's just a very generic concept. The actual implementation, it's really just a single function um, that takes just some byte blobs. Um, and we have like a runtime which manages all the relationships and the connection between um, the different components in the different runtimes. So it's a pretty straightforward concept. It's not new, it's just the way we implemented it is maybe a little bit specific. So on the high level, we have the components and the stubs. Um, our decision was to have like purely asynchronous interfaces, no synchronous calls, because it just doesn't scale across um, different runtimes. Um, we wanted really to have the stubs behave like the remote objects. Um, and the stubs not only are the interface to the user, but they also implement a lot of the heavy lifting, like the marshalling of the calls and um, the return values, the arguments, and also manage the lifecycle management because one key component here, if that one falls apart, um, you need to basically be able to, to make the component realize that. And also if like in one runtime, somebody releases a component doesn't use it anymore, you want to do the same basically on the other side. So you need a way to, to manage the runtimes, um, sorry, to manage the stops on both sides of, of your runtimes. The runtime itself is basically um, a publish subscribe interface where you can say, I want to publish a component, which is basically happening here. You publish a component in one runtime and the other on the other side, you can subscribe to a component whenever the other component is published to get it. Um, it also manages stops and it hides the transport channel 
um, from the user. Um, the transfer channel is just very generic. It can be basically anything that can implement one method and pass bytes from A to B. So in one case, it can be like a V8 binding, which has just a single method implemented, um, or it can be a generic WebSocket connection, gRPC, whatever like. So it's pretty generic overall. And if you want to use it, ACF, the first thing you need to do is you need to describe your interfaces because um, we need to generate code from that. So um, we decided to use WebIDL for that um, because it's well documented, it's a standard, it's easy to parse, there are parsers for that. Um, and like all the data types and semantics of the data types are also defined in there. Um, so we have interfaces, methods, and data attributes. So basically you define a conference manager and this one has a method to create conference and it returns a conference object and takes a string as parameter and another object as parameter. That's the method signature. Um, so key piece here and that's actually what enables the object remoting, the true object remoting in contrast to like just um, remote procedure calls is really the ability to pass interfaces from A to B over the method calls. And apart from that, we have just the basic data types that you will need. Um, nothing fancy, you know, maps, stuff like that. Um, but all the basics that typically enough, at least, was for us. Any questions so far? So if, if anybody has questions, please interrupt me. Just kick in. One question. Uh, there is no machine to machine boundary here. You are still on the single machine and you're tr just trying to cross the language. In, in that example, yes, but basically you can pull the runtimes. You could also have those completely separate, right? As long as you're able to establish a trans or set up the transfer channel in between, which is not something that ACF internally handles, but that's something like the setup phase that you as a developer need to do. Okay. Um, we also support like structs types. So that's basically just an interface without any method, just, just data attributes. Um, yeah. So second step is once you have that EDL, um, basically everything else happens from there. So there's a pretty heavy code generation involved. Um, that's what Hendrik wrote as a TypeScript JavaScript um, utility. Um, but it's for user, it's just a single CMake call that you invoke. Um, giving the IDL and you get out like CMake variable set where you get all the, basically all the outputs that you need in the further step and it generates a CMake target which spits out, spits out a library in the end. So for a developer, it's just a one-liner basically. Um, what the code gen does is it um, generates like um, protobuf files um, which are needed to actually implement object serialization. It does that from basically all the interface types that are defined. Um, and we also create, um, I think, yeah, that's here, that path. We create um, C++ files which contain code for all the stops. So all the stops and all the serialization logic, all the lifetime management stuff, this is all generated code. You will never have to look at and never have to touch. That's generated and also one output to the compiler. Um, and what we also do only for the C++ parts, so, oh, didn't, oops, it's not on there. So the code generation generates code for both TypeScript and both C++ in this case, which is important because you need both sides and you need basically the whole functionality for each side, even though you may just be using a subpart, right? So you may not use one interface on one side or create an object, so, um, but you still have everything available to use it symmetrically on both sides if you like. Um, for the C++ parts, we also um, take like lists of interfaces and the actual interface declarations um, and feed that into an internal tool that we have. It's called ProxyGen. It's generating proxies, which are um, threat safe um, wrappers basically around objects, which push, push each call you do onto a message queue in order to do threat decoupling in the calls and avoid that you run into deadlocks. So um, that's backed by a task executor framework we have. Um, also pretty standard, but you basically need all the machinery to get it to work. And in the end, you feed everything, all the files into the C++ compiler and get your library. So that's just my, just very elaborate what, what it all does. Um, one thing I want to point out, I'm not, that's coming on a later slide. So um, 
the stubs, it's not just one stub. It's like uh, four different types of stubs, stubs that we generate, um, which perform different parts of the call process. So you need one stub that you call as a user. You need one stub that gets invoked on the remote side. You need a stub that basically encapsulates your return values. And you need basically a representation of that again on the other side. So um, there are different ones that implementations for that. So the next step after you have run your code generation, um, in your user code, you need to initialize your runtime. Um, the key part here, and that's really the, the thing that makes it usable in a lot of contexts, is the transport channel. And the transport channel and the implementation of how it's implemented really depends on your runtime environment. So if you have interprocess node with a node process with a native add-on implemented in C++ and you want to, to use that, you will need a different um, transport then you would need, for example, for uh, intermachine communication, where you would use, like, I don't know, gRPC or something to do the actual connection between the machines. So, just as an example, the node part, um, node with a node process with a native component loaded from a shared lib as a native add-on. Um, we have like a utility loader, which is called V8 loader. It loads basically as a native add-on and loads from there a shared library, which contains the component. That was the part that fell out here in the code generation. Um, together with some code you need to implement as a developer, the actual functionality of the component. So, um, so that, that that loading component does a couple of things like creating like the registry where you do the pub sub of the component. Um, it wires up the transport. That's all hidden in, in that utility class we have. Um, and then it creates like a initialization function where you as a, as a component developer can basically register your components you have in your shared library with the runtime. So at that point, you do this, um, the publish of your components. Um, and in user code, um, it's actually very sim simple. It's in, in Node, it's just a three-liner. You just create that um, loader. You tell it where to find the DLL. Um, then you create basically on that side your component registry, which, which is taking a publish call from, from you later, uh, sorry, a subscribe call from you later. And basically, you register the transport um, and the registry together so that you can have like a bidirectional communication between those. And that's really all you need to do um, for the setup part. Um, and then you're ready to go, basically. So that's, again, initialization call from within the library. It creates, um, you create basically the component you have, um, and you publish that component. That's the initialization part. And from that on, anybody in the JavaScript runtime can, for example, say, subscribe for the component. It's of the conference manager type. It has that name. It the names have to match. So this pub type is just based on strings, just an identifier you choose. Um, and then you can just use the um, the remote, sorry, the, the stub object. So that one is the, the uh, we call it like the server side object. That's the actual implementation. And that one, that thing that you get out here is the stub. So that's the client stub that you can actually work on. And um, this one here would be just a regular JavaScript object that fulfills some interface um, of, of some method that you call here. So you create a listener, for example, and then you call on that stub object, just as you would do with a regular object, uh, create conference, and pass that local listener object in there. Um, and you get a conference back. And on the conference, again, you can, again, create, uh, do some other calls and get return objects, just as it would be a local class or local object. And actually, the stubs here are doing quite a lot of stuff. So imagine in the upper runtime, that is um, like the, the side dealing with the, um, with the stubs, right? So down here, that's basically the side that has the actual implementation. And that is one is the user code where you use the remote object. Um, so if you want that thing here that you call on, that's the client stuff, as I said before. Um, but you call on that um, a method, and you pass arguments in there. So strings are no problems. You can serialize them. Um, but if you pass complex objects, actually, the runtime needs to make sure that when, when you pass that object to the other side, the other side can actually use it just as you would use a stub here on that side. So it has basically to create like a server stub, 
So in, on that side, you have like a representation of that object that you pass in that's managed by the ACF runtime along with the lifetime. Um, and that one again is marshaled over to the other side so the other side can use it like a client. Um, and basically you always mirror all stops on all sides. And the same happens for the return argument. So um, assuming you call that method, this one will on the other side call um, the service stop, which actually has a reference to the actual component implementation. And that does something, maybe keeps as a member somewhere, stores the stuff that it receives to later call other methods on it and returns something. Then this return value basically again creates a or gets a stop representation. And that one is marshaled over. And on the client side, again, you just have a client stuff to work on. But you have like a really transparent object representation for the objects for all arguments and for all return values. Um, that's just for somebody who wants to look at all the details. It's just um, basically the call flow from you publish a component um, to subscribing it and calling a method and getting all that marshalling done. So if you would like to look at it, you can, can do so later. So the question is now you have that whole thing in place. Um, but if all the interfaces are asynchronous, how do you do that really in the C++ world, right? So we have a couple of options there, um, but we found most of them are not so good. So the greatest option we would have loved to use actually would have been the coroutines async await syntax. Um, but as a large company, it's just really difficult to upgrade um, the tool chains. Um, so for C++ 20, it will, it will be in there and support by the compilers is experimental right now. So that's one thing that we probably would not risk to use in production code. Um, the other part is even if we could have had, um, or we were like on C++ 17 and we wanted to upgrade, that's a lengthy process to really get all components that we have in our company to upgrade the tool chain, make sure everything works and all the dependencies work, all the third party dependencies work. So that's pretty much a long-term effort like for half a year or so to do that. So nothing for the for the fast stuff. Um, so that was another option. Um, the other option was C++ 11 standard features. How many of you are using that in your code bases or regularly? Yeah. <laughs> what's what's the experience? Are the are you using it at the interface levels? Um. No, not really. <laughs> but uh, even though the SD features and the uh, family stuff is uh, unfortunately forbidden in, uh, in our company. Yeah. Probably for a reason. Yeah. yeah. So we use those also mainly for testing code and as low level primitives. Um, but I will show in a second why we did not use those here for ACF. Um, the last option, basically the most classic one, are callbacks. Um, I'll show an example as well, and I guess we all know why not to do that. Um, so the, the main problem we have with standard features is that they're just not composable and they implement a pool semantic. Um, we may get continuation chaining, like composability um, with the concurrency TS, maybe in 20, C++ 23. Um, but I mean, they didn't make it in, into 20. So that was pretty disappointing. Um, so just as an example, imagine you have three functions um, that are asynchronous and one returns a token as an asynchronous return value and another one returns a session. It takes basically the token, so you need the token first because before you can call that method. And then you have a join session function which basically uses both of those to do the actual session join and it returns the session in the end. So if you want to write that with standard futures, you basically end up at a point very quickly, you can you can somehow delay that, but in the end you, you have that like really frequently that at some point to get a value you have to, to call future.get and that one will just block. So it's nice that you have an asynchronous join session function, that's your intent, um, but immediately at that point you're synchronous and you're just blocking until you get the return value of that one method. So it's, it's pretty much crap for asynchronous programming at that point, the way it's done. And if you need, like, again, later another 
um, future value in order to just call a method on it, again, you have to block. And then you cannot even reuse those futures and just have boilerplate type create a promise in order to set on a future a new value in order to then, then return the future. So it's really not something really usable in that case. So the most interoperable solution callbacks. Um, how many of you are using like heavy, making heavy use of callbacks in your interfaces? No? You? You are? <laughs> yeah, you're a JavaScript developer. <laughs> Mostly. Um, so the problem with callbacks, um, it just gets out of hand. So in this case, we only have like two functions we want to call, um, but even that, if you try to figure out the, the call flow and if you're using lambdas, which makes stuff sometimes a little bit easier to implement, maybe not more readable, um, but then you run immediately into lifetime issues because each time you nest a lambda, you basically need to capture the outer scope to pass something from outside into inside, into inside, into inside, and you end up in a situation where you have no clue who is holding a reference or who is not. So um, you may end up in typically in a point where you have either like a deadlock because a uh, destruction does not happen or you just, um, your application crashes because you forgot to capture something and the thing is already out of scope and try to figure out something tiny missing like that one in such a convoluted code base. So that's just also not working on, on a large scale. Should I step through that? Anyone in? Okay, so basically you have to read it from the from the um, bottom upwards, but you have to jump in between, right? So what you want to do is, the first thing you want to do is you want to authenticate. In order to authenticate, you need to pass two callbacks. One is the continuation, basically, if authentication was successful. The other one is, what do you do when an error occurs, right? So you have two callbacks you have to pass. So in order to create those callbacks, you have to go up here. You create one callback here, you capture your scope because you need those callbacks that you actually want to invoke when you have the session joined. So basically that's the continuation of that function. Um, where's my pointer? Um, and basically when authentication completes, right, you get, you need to pass, or you need to pass one thing that takes a, a token as a parameter, function that takes a token as parameter. Um, you have basically that one here, you get the token on authentication and then you want to create the session. So you create a callback in here and the create session call is done here. But first you have to create the callbacks, one for the successful case and one for the error case. Um, by the way, the authentication error word is down here and there you would call that function, right? Um, okay, but, but we were still at the creation part. We have not yet join. So we invoke the on join in here, which is actually that one. So you see you have to basically copy that continuation down here and down here and then here, finally you can use it. But you call here that error also from, so it, it's just a mess, right? Don't do it. And the strange thing is, I mean, other languages just, just do it brilliantly, right? So you may like JavaScript or not, but they have a really nice promise concept. Um, and really the, the key piece is they don't implement a pull model, they implement a push model. So when you have your value ready, your result ready of an asynchronous function, you push your value and that triggers really a complete continuation chain. Um, that's totally different from the way the standard future pulls the data out. So you in, in C++, you still have the standard promise where you basically push, but the thing to actually do something with the result, that in C++ is still like a pull model. And that's just totally different here. Um, so in JavaScript, basically the same functions you have here, you first authenticate, then you basically, you get a promise back. That's basically what's, what's the return value of the thing, a promise with a token. So a promise has a nice um, property that it either has um, the value or it, or sorry, it either resolves with a, with a value on success or it rejects the promise um, with, an, with an error. So you also have error handling in that whole concept in here, right? So what you do is you authenticate, you get a promise back and you can schedule a continuation on that, um, on that 
result, um, which is again a function, a async function. You get the token in here, and in there you can say, okay, create the session, and you pass a token in here, and that again returns a promise. And that promise again, here you can schedule the continuation that the session is passed, and then you have the session really in, not as a promise, but as a value, and you can join, and then you can return it, and in the end, if you return a value in here and you have an async function, that is turned automatically in a um, in a promise again. Correct? You're looking so. <laughs> and again, if you have like an, an error in here and the promise gets one of the promises gets rejected, basically the continuation chain below gets skipped and you end up in an error handler where you can do something meaningful with the error you get. So that's really nice. And that's something really nice we have been implementing as well for C++. So I'm really happy that I can tell you today, so you're the first public audience basically that we are telling um, that we are open sourcing that library. So you can have in C++ now promise types, we call them future library. The exact name of the library is not clear. It could maybe be called asyncly, but not sure if that will be it. Um, but the syntax is very, very, very similar in most cases. There, there are some catches in there. So you have to use basically an execution framework which supports task-based um, processing. Um, of the continuations, there are uh, some slight tricks in there. Um, but in the end, in user code, you end up with that. And that's just really nice to use if you compare it to JavaScript and all the other solutions you have before. So you can compare. It's basically, except for the language um, syntax, it's just identical in that case. And also you get like error handling in here. So if one of the methods throws an exception, um, then you can register uh, an error handler and you get an exception pointer and you can do something with a standard exception in that case. So that's also really nice. Okay. So that was the nice announcement. I hope you will have fun with that. If you if you want to know when it's out, um, you can also leave me a card or send me an email, um, and I will notify you when we release it. So with that, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them, and otherwise, just get more beer. <laughs> okay. How much effort is it to prove the concept, and how do you test this, what you wrote? How do you ensure that it's correct? Mm -hmm. Testing is. So the question was, how do we test that ACF, basically? Or do you mean the future library? That it works like you wrote, yes, the, uh, the future library. The future library, OK. So the question was, how do we test the future library? Um, we do a lot of unit testing with that. And we use the software also quite a lot in production code. Um, so we have like some live tests, I would say. Mm -hmm. But there's also heavy um, test coverage for the whole thing. So. Most of that is related to types and how to properly pass types. So because in the end, what happens here is basically when you return a type here, the thing that you schedule, you need to figure out what you will pass or you return something here. You need to figure out what will be passed to that function when you call it. And basically all the template magic is the tricky parts that you get all the R value stuff right, that you get the, the copyable or move only types right and select the proper overload so that you, so typically a lot of times you just get also compile errors if you get stuff wrong. But unit testing is basically most of what we do. So, and, and unit testing is enough because I mean, if it's about futures, you want to execute them on different threads. I mean, it's though, very strict about the unit testing, but unit testing also has threads. Yes. <laughs> yes. So we're testing on, on the, basically on the API level and assert that the expectations we have are fulfilled so that when something throws an ex exception in here, that we actually get an exception out or that the um, exception handler is called. So. Right. Just yes, time. yes, so, okay, 
in the future is uh, has finished and then no actually we're not not using standard futures for that we use standard promises so the promises are basically the push channel part for that right um no sorry i'm, I'm sorry i have to take that back <laughs> we're not using standard promises in that part we have an own promise implementation basically which creates a chain of function calls right so basically what happens here is um when you call that method um, then that one returns something like a future and on that future you register a new function that is to be executed when the first value is set right so at, at some point you you trigger the beginning of the whole chain by fulfilling the, the the promise that you get so you create it's it's um it's similar like in c++ you always have a future and promise pair but the promise works differently than the standard promise because the standard promise currently is tied to the standard future so it's but you you set a value or you set an exception on your promise um, this promise is something that you hand off to the function that's doing asynchronous work so you create you create the, the promise and the related future and you pass the promise on to maybe a worker thread that in the end will set the value. And once it sets the value or the exception, um, then that one, one will trigger the, the future that you had, um, but that will not, that will trigger like the whole chain of continuations that you registered with then on that future. So it's basically just a very long nested function call that it does. But it's not like a recursive, but it's using the task framework so you don't, don't have like um, really nested function calls. Yeah. So it's a future chain the, uh, just, uh, it's interrupted by, by another call. The, the task gets scheduled over there. What do you mean by interrupted? So if I have like a, an executor that has two threads and has three future chains running, they, do they get interrupted? If no, not really. So you you can run the executor is basically the thing that executes a task. So each each basically one of of those functions that you call. Um, the executor can run with a thread pool. So potentially you can um, execute the task. In, in, in parallel, um, but still pushing stuff on the queue, taking stuff out is is serialized by the queue. So that's safe. Any more questions? No, I have no backup slides. No backup slides. <laughs> yeah, there's more fancy features. Look for <laughs> look for the actual stuff on GitHub. So we're using that a lot now in our code base. Um, I have to say it's not easy to debug, right? So <laughs> if something happens, you need to find out where, where you are. But that's not much different from all the other um, techniques that we have, right? Do you know which license you're working on? No, not sure. It it will. It, I think it was. I think MIT was the proposal. So I think we'll be liberal enough that other companies can use it. But yeah. Yeah. Have you looked at Microsoft? I personally have not, but um, Yup, who's actually also doing a lot of that stuff, so he's basically also the um, the writer of that library. Um, He's like a big fan of it, and he has implemented like comparable stuff, like observables and stuff like that in there. So I'm not sure if that's going to be in the open source version, but probably it will. What's uh, the key difference between the Microsoft implementation and I I cannot say actually. Okay. I cannot do a comparison. What What do you think could be the difference, or do you see? Do you think they are totally Totally comparable. I did a talk, a previous talk, about uh, Microsoft implementation, mm -hmm. and what I discovered was that the exception handling is making everything really difficult for the compiler. So all the mm -hmm. compiler optimizations are gone because 
exceptions might get thrown, yeah. even though it's uh, it the synchronous code you want to write differently. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we have profiled that, but it would be interesting. Yeah, another talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to the framework you, you, you built on top of that, um, the ACF. Um, yeah. Is there anything, so from what it looked like, this is totally generic and would work with any kind of programming language. You implemented it for C++ and for JavaScript because that's what you're using. Yes. But there isn't anything in there that's specific to those languages, is there? Would it work if you say you want this match to go or do you whatever, Ruby or whatever it is? I think technically with any more or less modern language, you should be able to, to implement that. Um, I mean, none, none of those is doing magic, right? So because in the end, you're you're serializing everything into a path, right? Path, right. Uh, in yep. some way, and then there's only the question of, um, I mean, you have the stubs on both sides, and you so you implement in classes on both sides. Mm -hmm. and classes behave different, yep. uh, slightly differently in different uh, languages, yep. and memory management is different, and all of these things. So, um, so yeah, I have to adapt for that. Um, that's actually the, there's actually, there is one difference between the C++ and the TypeScript stuff. So C++, we do have um, destructors, right? So, which you get called if you drop, drop that object. Um, we don't have that in JavaScript. We just have to wait basically for the garbage collection. Um, so the JavaScript stops, they implement um, a dispose method that you can call if you like, um, so that you can immediately get rid of the remote object part. So that's that's actually one of the differences where the languages don't match, and that's. Technically, the most heavy lifting is done during both uh, generation time. Yeah. Because the stuff that we're doing is 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 the stuff then what is the end of the word to pass on the protocol object to the, to the transport channel and yeah. everything. So um, if we were to add another language, we would then add another process to the code generator that generates those stuff for another condition. Yeah, the key interesting parts are lifetime handling of things because in C++ you know when something goes out of scope. Yep. And if you might, with, with, the, with the combination of JavaScript and C++, you might actually come into the situation where you leak objects on the C++ side because they're still alive on the JavaScript side. And right. You know that they have been, uh, yeah. Yeah. So even, even if you release all references, um, I mean, V8 or the JavaScript engine is not, not forced to run a garbage collection and really release the stuff. So I, I've, I've run into that problem. I've, I've also tried to combine C++ code with JavaScript code and it was always a mess and it never really worked nicely. Um, so um, with your, um, just if, if I understand that correctly, so um, if you have a, a complex object that um, um, has sub-objects and um, you call a method that gets several complex objects that have sub-objects and don't, I mean, all yep. of these objects can be distributed yep. over the, the difference between C++ and JavaScript. Yep. And, and then you're calling a method that one calls something back. And in the end, you, 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 have, you have a chain of, yeah. For everything you do, um, you create the protobuf again and go back into the chain to the other side and yep. again to the other side and, yep. and everything. And there's there's nothing in there that um, recognizes. Um, oh, I, I'm 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 giving this object to the to the other side and he's probably going to call this met method on it to find an attribute of that object. So I'm I'm giving this this attribute yep. to the other side because I know he'll he'll need it or something. I, this looks like a lot of over overhead that you can get into if you're not careful enough. Yes. Um, how do you handle that? We don't handle it. <laughs> Clear answer. <laughs> no. Um, so, 
for for the use cases we we're using right now, it's it's really the simple part C plus um, plus embedded in as a native add on in V8 or um, the other way around, so V8 embedded into native C++ server. Um, in that case, we don't have that. So, But we did um, a small experiment where we like added like a routing component in the transport, so you could could like route between different processes or different machines, um, but we did not handle that issue that you may end up in like weird spaghetti and objects widely passed around. So I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm I'm not sure if you can really solve that. I'm I, I would doubt it. I don't I don't think you can solve it in a general way, but yep. you might be able to have some kind of tricks nope. where the programmer gives some hint in the uh, IDL file or something where it says do this magic yep. extra thing here or or so. We haven't done that. So you could use like the the object internal IDs and pass more information probably between the the runtimes around, but we didn't have the use case yet. It's an interesting problem for sure. So it's probably when you get really into a mess. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. More drinks. <laughs> cool.